Hi students and welcome to the second video in topic 7.2 nuclear reactions. In the last video we talked about mass energy equivalence and Einstein's special theory of relativity. We're going to talk more now about mass. We're going to talk about what's called a mass defect and the binding energy and some energy release in nuclear decays. In the next video I'll talk about nuclear fission and fusion, all right? <clears throat> Remember when we define electron volt? It's a very small unit of energy, okay? <clears throat> I wanted to find something else that's another very, very small mass. And uh, again, the reason why we use electron volts and atomic mass units, or U's or AMU's, is just to avoid using really, really small exponentials. It becomes very, very tedious. An AMU, you may know from chemistry, is defined as 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And it ends up being 1.66, etc., times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, we've talked about this a bit in class. What is it that keeps the nucleus from flying apart? Well, it's one of the fundamental forces in the universe it's called the strong nuclear force, okay? That's what holds it together. If it weren't for some force holding the nucleus together, because you have all of this positive charge crammed into a very, very tiny space, um, the whole thing would fly apart and no atoms would be stable. Now, it turns out that the strong nuclear force is extremely strong at about the radius of the atomic nucleus, uh, at 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's essentially zero at larger distances. So within the nucleus, Essentially, the same strong nuclear force exists between two protons, two neutrons, or between a proton and a neutron. So in order to separate the nucleons, you have to exceed this force by obviously supplying energy to the nucleus. And the strong nuclear force is exactly what its name implies. It's a very, very strong force that acts over a very, very, very short distance. That's what you need to know about it, okay? So just to give you an idea of the relative <coughs> strengths of the fundamental forces, if the strong nuclear force, if we call that one, you can see that gravitational, how much smaller the gravitational force is, and even how much smaller electrostatic is. Remember, re remember um, <clears throat> the gravitational constant and the K and Coulomb's law that will seek to that will serve to remind you the relative strengths of these forces. Okay, all right. You have to be um, familiar with something called the Segre plot, and what this shows is on the x-axis we have the proton number and on the y-axis we have the neutron number. So it's a ratio, um, it's a ratio of <clears throat> the neutron number to the proton number, okay? You can see that as the proton number increases, there comes a point when the balance of repulsive and attractive, in other words, electrostatic and strong nuclear force, cannot be achieved by an increased number of neutrons, okay? And the red line indicates uh, <clears throat> directly proportional or where n equals z. So eventually what happens is that the limited range of action of the strong nuclear force, which remember only acts over about 10 to the minus 15 meters and is zero for bigger distances, it prevents extra neutrons from balancing the long range electrostatic repulsion of extra protons, okay? <clears throat> so eventually what's going to happen is, is, is the nucleus becomes unstable and that turns out to happen with bismuth. So bismuth is the stable nucleus with the biggest number of protons um, and it's got 83 of those. So any, any nucleus with more than 83 protons tends to be unstable and it will spontaneously break apart or rearrange its internal structure as time passes, okay? And this spontaneous disintegration or rearrangement of internal structure we refer to as radioactivity, okay? Now remember the total energy, <clears throat> as we saw in the last video, is the sum of the rest energy and the kinetic energy, all right? So we said that delta E, <clears throat> or E is E naught plus KE, which is M naught C squared plus MC, okay? Now, if I combine the C squared terms, I have that delta E is delta MC squared, and this is the version of Einstein's mass energy equivalence that you see in your uh, data booklet, I believe has the change in energy and change in mass. Now, from your data booklet, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but the masses of these, of these um, the mass and the atomic mass unit, you have some pretty weird units here. So you have kilograms, that's cool. Then you have atomic mass units, which is also cool. But then you have this weird unit, for example, the mass of an electron, 0.511 mega electron volts per C squared, okay? What the heck does that mean? Well, that comes from this equation right here. If you solve for the mass, you can actually express it in terms of energy over C squared. That's where that unit comes from. It's a little bit, little bit weird, okay? Um, so mass can be expressed that way. You'll also see giga electron volts per C squared, but usually it's mega electron volts per C squared, okay? 
Now, um, note that the energy corresponding to one atomic mass unit, okay, that's going to be 931.5 mega electron volts. That's actually a really important number that you see a lot in problem solving. So that will come up again and again and again. Uh, you just want to kind of take note of that 931.5, okay, very useful conversion factor. As an example, go ahead and find the energy equivalent to the mass of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, and pause the video and try this. Okay, a proton is 938, neutron 939, and an electron is 0.511. So what we're doing is we're just we're just verifying uh, we're just verifying these up here. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Now remember that on the periodic table you have a, uh, which is the number of protons and neutrons, and then you have z, which is the proton number, number of protons. So the question that I'm posing to you, if you remember from your chemistry, is how would you find the mass of an atomic nucleus? So one way to do it is you could, if you knew the entire mass of the atom, okay, um, you could subtract from the entire mass of the atom. Um, the mass of the electrons times the number of electrons. Now, this is assuming that the atom is, um, has, a, has a neutral charge, has, has, has no net charge, where the number of electrons equals the number of protons, okay? All right, so go ahead, using this uh, method, go ahead and find the mass of a helium nucleus. Okay, when you do it, you find that the mass of the nucleus is 4.001500 atomic mass units. Go ahead and check my math. That's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so 4.001500 atomic mass units. But remember that helium has two protons and two ne neutrons. So the mass of a helium nucleus should be, if I multiply the mass of a proton as given in my IB data booklet table, um, if I take that and then the mass of a neutron, and there are two of each of them, <clears throat> I end up with a number that is not the same as the calculation I had before. In fact, the difference is 0 0.030400 atomic mass units. What is going on here? In fact, if you do these calculations with any atom, you'll find that there's a difference depending on the method. This is a big problem. You'll find that there's always going to be a difference. What to do? Well. Einstein came up with this thing called what he called the mass defect, and its, um, its symbol is the Greek letter delta, and it's the difference between the total mass of nucleons in an atom and the total mass of the nucleus. Very weird. Now, mathematically, we can say that the mass defect is A minus Z times the mass of a neutron, right, plus the Z times the mass of a proton, Got it? This is very simple when you remember what A and Z are, minus the mass of the nucleus. Now, most atoms have a mass defect, but they can differ depending on the kind of atom. So, for example, for lithium, if you do the calculation, uh, here's lithium-7 here, right? There's a calculation here, which you can pause the video and look at. You get a mass defect of 0 0.040475 atomic mass units. So what the heck is going on? Where is the missing mass? This is very, very, very bizarre, okay? Well, guess who came up with an explanation for it? It was Einstein, of course, in his theory of special relativity, which we talked about in the last video. He said that the missing mass is actually stored as energy inside the nucleus, which is something I have discussed previously. And I also talked about earlier how mass and energy can be converted into one another. Einstein came up with the, with the phrase binding energy, okay, the binding energy of the nucleus, and it's E sub B. And E sub B is given by the mass defect times C squared. This is another version of E equals mc squared, where C is the speed of light and delta is the mass defect as given by the equation which I stated to you earlier. Okay. Now the binding energy really is the work to completely separate or put together all the nucleons in a particular nucleus Okay, by the work energy theorem. And the binding energy of course varies between different nuclei and the reason is because the is because the mass defect varies as we as I stated before okay now again the binding energy is the work to completely separate or put together all nucleons in a particular nucleus okay kinda reminds you a little bit of the ionization energy with an electron doesn't it okay so the amount of work to remove one nucleon from the nucleus is roughly more or less the binding energy per nucleon okay which is e sub b over a or delta c squared over a okay turns out that this ratio of the binding energy per nucleon is really a measure of how stable the nucleus is if that ratio is is relatively high then you have a fairly stable nucleus okay 
And it's really important to note that the binding energy is not what holds the nucleus together. It is not the same as the strong nuclear force. Those are two different things. It's the strong nuclear force that holds the, that holds the nucleus together. The binding energy is just the energy necessary to completely separate or put together all nucleons in a particular nucleus, all right? As an example, pause the video and try this one. I want you to find the binding energy per nucleon of the nucleus of a carbon-12 atom. You might need a periodic table for this part of the course. Okay. Now you know that the mass of a nucleus is 11.996706 atomic mass units for a carbon-12 atom. Okay. Now, if I find the uh, mass defect, okay, I find that the mass defect is 0 0.098940 atomic mass units, which is 92.2 mega electron volts. Now per nucleon, I just divide that by 12 and I end up with 7.86 mega electron volts, okay? Now, you may have seen something in chemistry, if you haven't, don't worry about it, called the binding energy curve. And it's really the foundation of nuclear physics. And what it, what it graphs is on the x-axis, it has the nucleon number A, and then on the y-axis, it has the binding energy per nucleon, which is the number that you just found. So if you go back, we just found the binding energy per nucleon of carbon, a carbon-12 atom, okay? So carbon's gonna be somewhere right up in here. That's the number that we just found, seven point something, right? In nuclei where there are a lot of protons, the electric repulsion tends to push them apart, of course, right? So therefore, um, really large nuclei tend to be less stable. Um, and it's not possible for a nucleus to have more than about 300 nucleons and um, be stable, okay? Or, well, it's actually not, not possible for it to have uh, 300 nucleons at all, stable or unstable, okay? Now, we saw that uh, carbon-12 had, had a binding energy per nucleon of 7.68 mega electron volts. So it turns out that elements that are near the maximum of this curve, with respect, uh, generally a curve, there are a few outliers here, they tend to be the most stable and they're most in abundance, okay? Most nuclei have binding energy per nucleon of about eight mega electron volts, okay? So that's about the average, okay? The maximum of the func function is at A equals 62, nucleon number uh, 62, okay? And this is uh, nickel and iron, okay? This curve forms the basis for nuclear fusion and fission, which we'll talk about later. Now, comparing the binding energy curve to the Segre plot, which we talked about before, any differences or similarities? Okay, I'll let you think about that, and maybe we can talk about that in class together, but you should study the two and think about how they're different or similar. That would be a great question to discuss, okay? Um, and when you're doing so, remember what the binding energy is, right? Remember, remember the mathematical, the algebraic equation for binding energy and how that relates to the mass defect, okay? Turns out that eventually the binding energy per nucleon decreases enough so that there's insufficient binding energy to hold the nucleus together, okay? And that's why things are, that's why that side of the graph is um, unstable. Now, I want to talk a little bit about energy released in nuclear decays, all right? Um, we've talked about nuclear decays before, alpha, beta, and gamma decay, all right? And um, in order to really understand this further, I want to come up with an analogy, okay? Let's say you have a bowl, and you have a ball in the bowl. Now, if you want to lift the ball out of the bottom of the bowl, you obviously need to do work on it, okay? You can think of that work, like if you actually reach into the bowl, get the ball out, and pull, you're going to apply a force through a distance, you're doing work on the ball. That work can be thought of as the binding energy of the nucleus. Now, when the ball is in the bowl, it doesn't have that energy, right? It's just sitting there, and there's been no work done on it. It's what's, it, that's what's lost when it rolls to the bottom, and you gain that when you lift it to the top edge, okay? And all physical systems will try to reach a position of lowest possible energy. That's one of the sort of tenets of the universe, right? So if possible, a nucleus will change. If it's possible, a nucleus will want to change into one with lower energy. And that means that a nucleus will naturally change to one with more binding energy as possible. That's what happens in nature, okay? All right, now the binding energy is the work to completely separate all the nucleons. So binding energy is therefore released when the nucleus is formed. And changing to a higher binding energy means that energy is released, which is a little bit counterintuitive, or a nucleus is formed in that case, okay? So again, the most stable elements are at the top, right? So you have copper, nickel, and iron, okay? Down here, 
Uh, the average binding energy per nucleon is zero since there's only one particle in the nucleus. <clears throat> and these here, this uh, helium and carbon and oxygen are relatively stable compared to their neighbors because they have, these are little spikes of a higher average binding energy per nucleon, okay? Now, getting out here to the right-hand side, okay, <clears throat> looking at these elements, what is this bismuth, thorium, uranium, okay? Thorium-233 has a higher binding energy than uranium-235. Therefore, it would be, you could say, ener energetically favorable for uranium-235 to change into thorium-233. But this might not be possible. It doesn't, it doesn't always happen, but it would be energetically favorable for that. There, there's a chance that it may happen, but it does not always happen. Okay? Now, the binding energy per nucleon is roughly constant above about A equals 20. Okay, roughly speaking, which is right in here. Remember, we said that the average was about uh, was about eight. Okay, now to figure out whether decay is released energy, we actually now have to calculate the mass difference. Okay, because you know that energy is mass is is uh, the energy mass equivalence. Delta M is the total mass of the reactants mi minus the total mass of the products, okay? If it's a positive delta M, it means that energy will be released and the, the, the decay will occur. If it's negative delta M, uh, the, the decay will not occur, okay? All right, so for example, in alpha decay, remember alpha decay are really helium nuclei with two, two protons and two neutrons. And remember that I said that um, helium was unusually stable relative to its neighbors because of that spike, okay? So it turns out then, therefore, that an alpha particle is ejected from a more massive, unstable nucleus, right? Which, of course, is what we saw when we studied alpha decay before. And the alpha particle moves away from its daughter with discrete values of kinetic energy, which we talked about before, okay? All right, try this example real quick. I'm sort of running out of time with this video. I don't want it to be too long. Okay, the energy release when alpha, de alpha decay converts uranium into thorium, okay? Uh, there's my decay equation, right? So I just calculate an atomic mass units, those energies, okay? I get a mass difference of 0 0.0046 atomic mass units, and then I convert that to mega electron volts. That's the energy release when alpha decay converts uranium to thorium in such a way. Now, what about beta decay? We talked about beta minus beta plus, mostly beta minus before. You know that beta rays are electrons or positrons, Okay, uh, it turns out that, the, that, that that beta particle does not exist within the parent nucleus, okay, and that's an electron, okay. If it's a positron, uh, you would have this symbol, which we'll talk more when we get to 7.3, okay, and you know that beta particles move away from the daughter uh, nucleus with a continuous range of kinetic energy values as, as we've talked before, okay. Here's another example. Try example 8, pause the video and try this one on your own. Okay, <clears throat> classic IB pass paper question. Find the energy release when beta minus decay changes thorium into, uh, what is that? Is that polonium? Okay. All right. So we have, there's, there's, the, there's the decay equation. The energy released during the decay, I've calculated as 0.00029. Okay. And again, I convert that, <clears throat> okay, to, uh, to, to an energy. And that's going to be the maximum kinetic energy that the electron can possibly have, all right? So when a beta minus particle is emitted by a nucleus, energy is released. Now, experimentally, it's found that most particles don't have enough kinetic energy to account for all the energy released. It's very interesting. So if a, if a particle carries away only part, where does the remainder go? This was a big question in physics, okay? All right, in 1930, Pauli proposed that part of the energy, now we're getting into quantum a little bit, right, is carried away by another particle that must be emitted along with the, along with the particle, okay? That's where the neutrino came from. You've heard about neutrinos. We'll talk more about that in topic 7.3. Neutrinos were verified experimentally in 1956. So if we want to write this decay more properly, beta minus decay, we have to include a neutrino. And I think when we studied 
uh, beta decays before, I included the neutrino in my decay equations. Um, and that's the reason why, because there's, we have to account for that, for that uh, missing energy, okay? And it's the Greek letter nu, it's not a V, all right, even though it looks like a V, okay? If beta plus decay occurs, a normal neutrino is emitted without the bar. A couple of things about neutrinos to kind of get you interested in topic 7.3 before we get there, okay? They have zero electric charge. They probably travel less than C, we don't know. Very difficult to detect because it interacts very, very weakly with matter, okay? We know that there's a lot of it in the universe, and since we know that there's a lot, if the mass is determined, it could help possibly explain dark matter and galaxy formation, but that's another topic for another day, okay? Gamma decay, the last kind of decay. You know that gamma rays are photons that have a lot of energy. They're, they're dangerous for you. You don't want to be exposed to them. And gamma rays are emitted when a nucleus changes from an excited higher energy state to a lower one and emits that photon, okay? Gamma decay does not cause a transmutation. And you know that the photon moves away from the parent nucleus with discrete values of kinetic energy, okay? All right, as an example, try to determine the wavelength of the 0.186 mega electron volt gamma ray emitted by radium, given these numbers. Try that one. Okay, wavelength. Well, using HC, uh, using that the energy is HC over lambda, you can end up with a wavelength of 6.68 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Welcome to quantum. We're finding a wavelength of a particle, a gamma ray or a photon. It behaves as a particle and as a wave. Okay, more on that later. Okay, all right, so we've seen that. In any decay equation, conservation laws are going to be obeyed. We have charge, mass, nucleon number, okay? Um, of course, the conservation of energy. Assuming the decaying nucleus is at rest when it decays, for a decay to take place, therefore, the mass of the decaying nucleus has to be greater than the combined masses of the products. Why? Well, because some energy is obviously converted to kinetic energy after the reaction because things are moving after the actual decay takes place. So in other words, the binding energy of the product nuclei has to be greater than the binding energy of the decaying nucleus for the same reason. It's just another way of saying the same thing, all right? Okay, this is a past paper question, I think from 2010, I can't remember. All right, go ahead and spend some time on this one. Pause the video and try to do this one, okay? Okay, so radium undergoes alpha decay. The atomic masses of radium and radon are given, all right? Assuming the radium nucleus is at, is at rest, find the product nuclei, okay? All right, okay. Total energy release, about 10 to the 11 joules. Wow, that's a lot, right? Which product nucleus has the greater speed and how much greater than the other is this? The alpha particle has the greater speed 50 times 55 times faster, and that's because of the difference in masses ultimately, right? By using the conservation of momentum. If you want, we can spend a little time in class, more time in class going through this problem, especially part C is a little bit tricky, so I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you guys have about it, okay? One more example to round out this video. Try this one. This is a more recent past paper question. Transmutation of nitrogen, okay? An alpha particle collides with nitrogen. Determine the mass difference and calculate the minimum kinetic energy necessary in order for the reaction to take place, okay? The mass difference, okay? I got that it's, it's a negative mass difference. And since it's negative, it means that the reaction only takes place if, the energy, if energy is given to the reactant, okay? Calculate the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. The reaction will only take place if the alpha particle has a minimum kinetic energy equal to the mass difference, all right? Um, which I figured out before, and that's 1.707 mega electron volts, okay? So you're gonna maybe wanna rewind this video and maybe watch it again, especially when I go through some of the deeper, uh, deeper discussions and some of the examples. You're also gonna wanna refer to your textbook. Sokos does an excellent job with this topic. Um, and so this class is getting more complicated. This is a complicated topic. We will, even when we get to higher level, we study this as a higher level topic exclusively. It will be quite complicated. So you're really going to want to use the textbook as a resource in addition to these videos in our classwork.